Nintendo's success with the NES and the Game Boy systems had done wonders to revitalize the failing video game industry. The move to bring the consoles west had been a huge gamble, but it had paid off big time. The video game industry was on the rebound, and thanks to the release of titles like Super Mario Bros., The Legend of Zelda, Kid Icarus, and Metroid, Nintendo was at the forefront of the market. Though the NES, released in 1985, was starting to show its age. Sensing a chance to dethrone the king, two new competitors threw their hat into the ring to compete against the dominant NES. In Japan, the TurboGrafx-16, known as the PC Engine, was stealing the show, and longtime arcade competitor Sega had thrown down the gauntlet in the West with the release of the Sega Genesis. The Sega Genesis, which boasted 16-bit graphics years before Nintendo would release the SNES, was proving to be a huge problem. With titles like Sonic the Hedgehog and ad campaigns like this, what Nintendo? Sega had managed to capture the attention of many fans looking for the next generation of gaming. Though Masayuki Uemura, the developer of the original NES, was working on a successor to the console, it wouldn't be ready until 1991, giving the Genesis enough time to grow and find an audience. Although the SNES outsold the Genesis 4 to 1, Nintendo's one-year absence from the market had allowed Sega to get a foot in the door. In the first video, we covered the design philosophy of Gunpei Yokoi and how it impacted Nintendo's products. He, along with Masayuki Uemura, laid the groundwork for Nintendo's physical hardware. Hardware was of course important, but as games grew more complex, we saw the design philosophy at Nintendo shift towards an emphasis on software titles. Shigeru Miyamoto was at the forefront of Nintendo software, and his design philosophies for games would help take Nintendo into the 21st century. Miyamoto's approach started with one of the core principles set down by Yokoi. Video games need to be accessible. Accessibility to Miyamoto and Yokoi meant creating a challenging yet fun experience that would keep a person coming back to explore. Miyamoto also wanted to channel his personal experiences into the games he designed and evoke emotions, not with story, but with design. During an interview for The Legend of Zelda, he spoke about his childhood experiences and how they were channeled into the game. Miyamoto was a bit of an explorer when he was young, and at one point he stumbled on a very dark cave that he could never quite find the courage to enter. It wasn't until he got hold of a lantern that he first dared to step inside. As the light from the lantern washed over the walls and took away the dark, a kind of wonderful, fearful joy took over. That was the joy of discovering the unknown, the joy of adventure. As a video game designer, he wanted to replicate those feelings. Exploration was a key part of the game, but exploration wasn't always helpful. Stepping into the unknown could lead you to a dungeon well beyond your ability, or a helpful orc that hands you money. You didn't know at the time unless you tried to move forward and explore in the game. Miyamoto would go on to become the leading power of Nintendo's creative force over the years, producing some of the company's most popular and iconic mascots. This isn't to say Nintendo wasn't filled with other wonderful, talented game designers. There was Masahiro Sakurai, creator of Kirby and the co-creator of the Smash Brothers series, Satoru Iwata, the other co-creator of the Smash Brothers series, and a big programming force at HAL Laboratories. Shigesato Itoi, creator of the Mother series, Earthbound in the States. And again, there was Gunpei Yokoi. Each one of these men was extremely talented in their own right, but Miyamoto was at the front. Together, they made the SNES a powerhouse console that absolutely destroyed the Genesis in terms of sales. In the early 90s, Nintendo was untouchable, and they absolutely knew it. The video game market was beginning to shift, however, and a debate arose in the industry about the future of games. Would they be on discs, or would they remain on cartridges? Nintendo argued for cartridges, but only because they owned a number of cartridge production plants, 
but ignoring the trend of discs would put them behind development. So in 1988, Nintendo approached Sony to make a proprietary disc reader attachment for their SNES. Sony's prototype was called the PlayStation. Sony unveiled the PlayStation in 1991 at a consumer electronics show where they announced a partnership with gaming giant Nintendo. The very next day, Nintendo revealed that they were partnering with Philips instead, Sony's direct competitor, which came as a big shock to everyone, especially Sony who had no idea Nintendo was formally breaking the partnership. Negotiations behind the scenes had apparently broken down between the two companies. Sony wanted to maintain control over the Super CD, the disc the PlayStation would use in conjunction with the SNES, which would effectively hand the software rights for the system over to Sony. Nintendo, fearing a loss of control and a loss of revenue, pulled out of the deal and instead negotiated more favorable terms with Philips, but didn't bother letting Sony know ahead of time. The deal with Philips turned into a complete disaster. The licensed games Philips produced were garbage, and the CDI never caught on, resulting in a gigantic commercial failure. One of the biggest missteps Nintendo would ever make. Great! I'll grab my stuff! There is no time. Your sword is enough. How about a kiss? For luck. You've got to be kidding. 1995 saw the release of the Virtual Boy, designed by Gunpei Yokoi. Gamers everywhere know about the Virtual Boy and how it was an absolute failure, but not a lot of people really know why. Once Nintendo acquired the hardware from Reflection Technologies, an American-based company experimenting with vibrating mirrors, Yokoi launched into work on attempting to adapt it to a new console which would be his final gift before leaving Nintendo. Yokoi had been planning to leave Nintendo for a number of years now. Not because he hated his position, he absolutely loved what he did, but he firmly believed Nintendo's approach to game design was not sustainable. To him, as the games and consoles grew more technologically complex, it would lead Nintendo down a path of chasing the newest graphics chips and newest hardware, Rather than opening up design possibilities with new technology, he felt that the ever-growing price tag would inhibit developers from creating innovation, as they'd be forced to chase the latest and greatest, rather than finding a way to make it unique. The Virtual Boy went through many forms in Nintendo's R&D department. A pair of goggles that proved to be too heavy and would suffer from visual distortions thanks to a chip. A bulky plastic design that could be strapped to your head, which was ultimately scraps thanks to liability concerns. And then finally the design we know today. A rigid tabletop system that didn't make much sense. And that Yakoi absolutely hated. To him, the portability of the Virtual Boy had been its greatest asset. The entire thing had been designed by him to be mobile and 3D, and because of this, to keep the battery from draining quickly, they chose to move forward by using a less powerful processing chip when there was much more power available. Now that the console was going to be a non-mobile gaming device, Yokoi just didn't see the allure of the system. He suggested numerous times to the Nintendo execs to give him more time to develop the system properly and to allow him to create a more intuitive, alluring design but the advice fell on deaf ears. Due to the impending release of the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation in 1994, Yamauchi and the marketing team at Nintendo pressured Yokoi to finish the Virtual Boy and launch it as a competitor to the two systems. The Nintendo 64, Nintendo's next console, wouldn't be ready to launch until 1996, giving their competitors free run to grow. Fearing the same type of growth they saw with the jump in sales for the Sega Genesis and the TurboGrafx-16, development on the Virtual Boy was ramped up, despite Yokoi's insistence on scrapping the system. When the Virtual Boy debuted in 1995, it was by all accounts a commercial failure. But to be absolutely clear, it wasn't the fault of Gunpei Yokoi who wanted to develop the hardware and software behind the system and turn it into something great. The technology to make something new and incredible was there. Yokoi could see it, 
but the haste to put it out to the market, more than anything, led to the system's failure. Thanks to how badly the Virtual Boy sold on release, 3D technology would not be touched again for over a decade, until the beginning prototype of the Oculus Rift. Yokoi shouldered a majority of the blame for the Virtual Boy's failure. As an apology to his company, he developed the Game Boy Pocket. Yokoi left Nintendo after that and opened up his own product development company to work on any project that happened to come his way. His departure from Nintendo would leave a pretty large hole, but as already mentioned, the principles he taught during his tenure had already been passed down to a new generation of engineers and developers who could carry on his legacy. As Nintendo moved towards the launch of their fifth generation console in 1996, they would face their greatest challenge yet. Longtime competitor Sega had returned with the Saturn, but the biggest rival by far was Sony who had revealed the disc-based PlayStation. They even managed to snag longtime Nintendo developer Square, makers of the popular Final Fantasy franchise. The choice to continue using cartridges had been the major reason Square had abandoned Nintendo's platform. Final Fantasy VII was a large game, far too large to fit on a single cartridge. Fearing that Nintendo might ask them to cut down the scope of their game to satisfy available space, Square had moved over to the PlayStation, where the game would be released on three separate discs. Had the Nintendo 64 used discs instead of cartridges, we might have seen Final Fantasy stay with Nintendo. By sales alone, the winner of the console wars had been decided. The N64 sold 33 million units over its lifetime. The Sega Saturn had moved just over 9 million. The PlayStation soared past them both, moving a whopping 100 million units. For the first time since Nintendo had released the NES in 1985, a competitor had just outsold them. Sony had just loosened Nintendo's stranglehold on the video game industry. Yet strangely enough, Nintendo still had a remarkable fiscal year despite being second to another console thanks to the release of one game, Pokemon. Pokemon had driven sales of the Game Boy systems to insane levels, and even though Nintendo had just lost the battle for the home console, they were easily winning the war on the mobile gaming market. Towards the end of 1997, the gaming world received some pretty bad news. Gunpei Yokoi had been killed. The father of portable gaming consoles had rear-ended a truck on the expressway, and as he got out to check on the condition of the other driver, he was sadly struck by a passing car, and pronounced dead two hours later. Gunpei Yokoi was later recognized with two Lifetime Achievement Awards for his pioneering works in the field of video games and technology. Yokoi served Nintendo for 31 years, and led them to prominent success. From the early days in 1966, where he maintained the Hanafuda assembly lines, to the later years of designing the Game Boy Pocket, he had spent his career leading Nintendo towards the future, and he would be greatly missed. On March 3rd, 1999, Nintendo announces a successor to the N64, codenamed Project Dolphin. Though news was scarce over the coming months, the gauntlet for the next big console war had been thrown down. When all the consoles and their competitors were revealed, things looked pretty grim for Nintendo. Sony had brought the PlayStation 2, a sleek, black monolith that boasted some impressive technical specs. Microsoft had the new Xbox, which boasted similarly impressive specs to the PlayStation 2, but was criticized for how big it was. Nintendo had the GameCube, by far the smallest and most oddly designed of the bunch. I hate using the word sexy to describe consoles, but the GameCube just wasn't sexy. With the lunchbox handle and miniature sized discs, it just wasn't as impressive at showing off as the PlayStation 2 and Xbox was. Microsoft and Sony had just revealed the future of consoles and the GameCube was not it. It looked like it was built for small children, 
And without even Mario on the lineup roster of launch titles, people weren't as excited about the system. The PlayStation 2 sold a staggering 155 million units over its lifetime, becoming the number one selling console of all time. The Xbox sold just under 24 million, and the GameCube undersold both competitors at 22 million units worldwide. Like last time though, Nintendo still had a huge year in mobile gaming, thanks to the Game Boy Advance and SP systems, moving just shy of 82 million units. Those numbers, combined with the sales of the GameCube, yielded an extremely profitable year in gaming for Nintendo, despite the underwhelming home console sales. They were in the race still, but only because of the mobile market, and with Sony trying to make headway with the Sony PSP, the future of the company looked to be pretty uncertain. Nintendo would need to undergo some big changes in order to stay in the console game, but under Yamauchi, the internal departments of Nintendo were almost at war. The company did not communicate with one another. It would take one man's influence to restructure the internal components of Nintendo as a company and get them back on track to compete against their biggest rivals yet.